Uh, we're going to begin a, a new study here. It's called um, A Living Faith for a Spiritual Life. A Living Faith for a Spiritual Life. And we're studying 2 Peter, so let's start from the beginning. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, the author identifies himself and he says, I'm Simon Peter. Simon was his name that was given by birth, but Jesus changed it to Peter. He said, uh, you'll no longer be Simon, but be Peter. And so he said, I want you to know I'm the Simon that the Lord changed his name to the rock. <clears throat> I'm also known as Rocky or I am Peter. But then he adds these terms. I am a servant or a slave, a doulos, a slave, and an apostle. Wow. I'm a slave on the one end, and I'm an apostle on the other. An apostle means that God has called me, <clears throat> and he has sent me forth with a commission. He's been commissioned by Jesus Christ and sent out to spread the good news. So he says, I'm a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now he says, now he tells us who he's writing to. To those through who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. I, I like that. Because this letter is written to you and me if you know Jesus. He says, if, you, if you've accepted Christ, you have faith in Christ as I do, then this, this letter is being written to you. And then he says his greeting, typical greeting, grace and peace. Uh, this was a typical uh, hello in, in the ancient world. Uh, you know, the, the grace uh, and, and the peace were the way you said hello to. Uh, and he says, but, but it's heightened for the Christian because we have the grace of God in our lives, which brings us the peace of God in our lives. And he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through our knowledge of him, of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the introduction to the book. And now he turns, he says, I want to talk to you about a living faith. He's already said, hey, you've been called to this faith, but he said, now I want to talk about a living faith. You see, a living faith requires recharging your spiritual batteries. I was saved at eight years old, and I got my first boost to my battery. I became a Christian, and I told people about Jesus. You know what happens over time? I've watched this over. I try to keep newborn Christians away from the seasoned ones because they tend to drain the battery of the, the newborn. The newborn Christian's so on fire for God and so excited. I don't want them to get them around those grouchy, grumpy old Christians who've let their battery get drained. You know what I mean? Spiritually, they talk about things that the Lord did 20 years ago. Well, what has he done this week? This new Christian's talking about things God's doing every day. You see, their spiritual batteries have been drained. <clears throat> I want to talk about recharging your spiritual batteries, and it all starts with the divine power. The divine power. This is our memory verse for this month. It comes right here. 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power, that power is when God merely spoke and everything that is came to be. I am a creationist. I am not a big bang guy. There was a big bang, but it's called a divine fiat by theologians. God just simply spoke and boom, everything was there. You see, when you, when you talk to somebody who believes in big bang, you say, well, what was there before the big bang? And then they scratch their head and say, good question. I'll tell you what, our God is eternal, and by His divine power, He has created everything in this world, and everything we need for life and godliness is here. Everything we need. Listen, you need water to drink, to live, He provided that. You need food, He's provided that. You need shelter? Well, he's provided everything for you to make a shelter. <laughs> it just goes on and on. There's nothing that you, have, that you have that you did not receive because God has provided everything we need for life. It's here. But then he adds, and godliness. Godliness. Every now and then somebody says, well, it's easy for you to be a Christian. You grew up that way your whole life. But see, I got all these bad habits and I just have a hard time. 
everything you need for godliness, God has given you. You got it. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's equipped you with everything you need. He says here, it's through the knowledge of Him. You know, a lot of people will tell me, well, I just don't feel. Well, stop relying on your feelings and start relying on what you know. He says here, through knowledge of Him. Now, I want to focus on, it's knowledge not about Him, but of Him. You can read a book and get a lot of knowledge about something, but really never know that something. I could say, I know President Biden. I mean, I could just say, you know, we're, 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 we're just like that. And I mean, he's over there and I'm way over here. <laughs> Because I don't know him. And this is what this text is about. Through our knowledge of him, I have a relationship with him. And that relationship comes from a knowledge of knowing the scriptures. Because the scriptures speak of Christ. Even Jesus said, you search the scriptures. And the scriptures speak of me. They speak of Christ. So when we read the scripture, we're, we're reading about our Savior and we're gaining a knowledge of him, the one who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, when I got saved at eight years old, I didn't have a cell phone in my pocket and he didn't dial me up and call me and I said, well, hello, Lord. <laughs> he tugged on my heart and I confessed that I was a sinner and that Jesus was the Savior and he came into my life and saved me. He saved me. You see, you got to start, at, that's the starting place. You, you might think of your, your faith as the battery. It's the battery, and you got to have that battery. <clears throat> he says, recharging takes God's promises as well. Not just his power, but it takes his promises. He says, through these, and the question becomes, what are the these? The these refers back to his divine power that he's provided us for life and for godliness and, and for knowledge of him. Listen, he said, through these, he says, that calling through all of these things, he has given us a very precious promise. God is promising you. And here it says very precious, promises, plural. The Bible is loaded with promises. One of the great promises I find in Titus 1, 2, it says, in hope of eternal life. You, you, you interested in living forever, forever and ever? In hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie, he cannot lie, he promised before the, the beginning of time, <clears throat> and, and that promise is that if you accept Christ as your Savior, you call upon him to save you, he will save you for all eternity. <clears throat> <clears throat> Most of us know John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the promise. That's the promise. The promise. But it goes beyond that. He says, so that through them, but, but through that calling, through that faith, all of that, through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Now, something wonderful happened the moment I accepted Jesus Christ as an eight-year-old kid. And I really wish I could pull my shirt apart like that and you could see who's inside. But Ephesians says, he dwells in my heart by faith. The moment I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, he started to indwell me by his Spirit. So much so that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and also in chapter 6, it says, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in me. I have been invaded by God. Here he says, through them, you may participate in the divine nature. Wow. God is in me. This blows my mind. When he says you, you have eternal life, it's because God now dwells in me by his spirit. He's taken up residence within me. I have a new nature connected with the God nature. I have a divine nature that I'm connected to. He says, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, when I connect with Jesus who indwells me by faith, I am being a participant in the divine nature. Now, I got a new nature the moment I accepted Christ the Savior. I didn't know that at the time. But with your nature, you see, your nature determines your appetite. Did you ever notice that the pigs will eat anything? <laughs> they'll go to the sloth and they'll just, you throw out any garbage. I, I used to go with my uncle to feed the hogs. And we would take all the slop, everything that was left over in the kitchen from a large family, 
and, and uh, we throw all those in and we drive down and we throw it and they'd eat anything, anything. You go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and it says a dog will even eat its own vomit. Whew. That's disgusting. It's there, it's in the Bible. Whew. Everybody's appetite is according to their nature. You know, when you were a lost person without Christ, you know what you desired? All the sinful things of the world. You did. That's what you wanted. But the moment you receive Jesus Christ, you get a new appetite. You're hungry and thirsting for God. You're hungry and thirsting for God. Because you have a new nature. You've been born again. You've been born of the Spirit of God. You've got this new, new nature. You've got a new relationship. God's within you. So it changes your behavior. All of a sudden, you're not interested in going to the places where you used to go and doing the things you used to do. You're now wanting to do new things. Like, I want to get up and read my Bible. Oh, I want to go to a prayer meeting. I want to join a small group. Hey, I... For some reason, I want to tell people about Jesus. It's just put inside of me. I got new behaviors. Pretty, pretty soon everybody's saying, I don't know what happened to you. You're kind of weird. <laughs> My cousin accepted Lord, and he was a truck driver, and he had such a foul mouth when he went to work that God cleaned up his mouth. And he wasn't swearing and telling all of his dirty jokes. And in fact, he's finding good, good jokes that had no swearing in them. And, and somebody finally came to him and said, Kenny... What happened to you? And he said what? First came to his mind. He said, I found Jesus. <laughs> it wasn't that Jesus was lost. <laughs> he was lost. Jesus wasn't lost. He was lost. But Jesus found him. You see what I'm saying? His behavior had radically changed because he became become a new creature in Christ. Listen, he goes on. Your environment changes. You want to be in church. It's not that you got to be in church. Going to church does not save you. Getting baptized does not save you. But a person who's, who's really got this new nature, they want to obey their Lord and they want those things. So they, they find themselves in a whole new environment. And the next thing you know, they got new associations. The old people they hung out with don't want anything to do with them anymore. They think you're weird, you're strange. When you're around, I have to curtail the way I am because you make me feel guilty of my sin because you're not sinning with me anymore. And as a result, you find that you gravitate, new people who love the Lord gravitate to, towards you, and pretty soon you've got a whole new sphere of friends. You still try to keep connected with them, but you know that with them, it's awkward. Why? Because you're a partaker of the divine nature. You've got God's power working in you to change you. On top of all of that, he says, and you escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. The more you love the Lord, the less you desire the things of the world. And so you're putting them to death and you're escaping all the pitfalls, all, all the the things that go with, with, with those uh, acts of corruption, those things are, are going away and you're having a whole new life in Christ. These are powerful verses. These are powerful verses. You see, recharging your faith takes some additives too. If you think of your faith as like a battery and you, you accept Christ and boom, you're charged. It's a brand new battery and it's got power because you know the Lord, and, and, and man, you're drawing off of that, and you're drawing off of that. And he says, but for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Oh, I, I want to talk to you. Do you remember my 1974 American Motors uh, Corporation Hornet Sportabout? That, you know, I remember I told you the story. I was driving along, and a hood flipped open on me, and I was slammed on my brakes, pulled over to the side of the road, and, and then uh, got home. I got my I remember I had, I, I, I get close the hood, I'm up outside jumping up and down on the hood to get it shut because it wouldn't shut. Got it home, tried to open it then so that I could check what was wrong with it and then it wouldn't open so I went back down to church in the exact same spot where it sprung open before and it sprung again and then, you know, and then I got out and I'm jumping up and down on the hood to get it to close and I finally get to church and, 
It's the same one I broke the hatch off the back. It's the same one that the, the wires on the inside crisscrossed and all of a sudden it was on fire and, and they're telling me in the bank that there's a, there's, on the, they're announcing, there's a car in the parking lot, a station wagon that's on fire. And my son's pulling on paths and saying, Dad, we got a station wagon. I said, oh, no, no, we got a sport about. And uh, I get out there and sure enough, smoke's rolling out from underneath the hood of this car. This car whew, was trials and tribulation. You get what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, on a different occasion. You, can, you just know something's going to happen to this car, right? Because I'm telling the story. I pull into the Kmart parking lot, go in. That's back in the days of Kmart. And, and, and then I, I come out, and I get in the car, put my key in, and it goes, da 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 Anybody ever heard that sound? You know what the deal is? Dead battery. So I pop the hood. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know this battery's old. It's not going to... guy pulls up next to me, and he sees my hood open and says, what's the problem? I said, oh, I'm pretty sure I got a dead battery. I turn and go, that, 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 that. He said, oh. He said, I can give you a jump. But he said, why don't you do this? How long you had the battery? He looked because he's looking at it. He said, oh, I, this, I've had this battery a long time. He said, oh, you, that battery just needs a real good recharge. He said, what you need to do is go into Kmart, and for a buck fifty, a buck fifty, I can get a bottle of Rejuvenator. I said, what? Rejuvenator. He said, rejuvenator. He said, what you do is you get that little bottle, and you open up the battery, and you pour an equal amount in every cell. He said, you close it up. He said, I'll jump you then. You let it run for about 15 minutes, I guarantee you that battery will last another year. Sure enough, I went in the store, paid my buck 50, got my rejuvenator, went out there, poured a little bit in every cell, slapped that thing back on. He jumped it. I let my car run. I'll tell you what, that car ran for the next year and a half on that dead battery. <laughs> because I added to the diminished battery the additive to recharge. I think that's what this passage is about. Sometimes our spiritual batteries are drained. Our faith is drained. Things in this world are just draining us and draining us. And we are not putting in the rejuvenators. We're not adding to our faith what he says. He says, add to your, he says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Goodness. The Greek word is actually moral excellence. Moral excellence. You know what moral excellence is? The exact opposite of immorality. <laughs> Things that are not moral. So what he's saying is add to, add to, your, add to your faith. Let, let, let's just take sexual relationship. Add to your faith a good marriage. Work on your marriage. He said if you work on your marriage, you're going to strengthen your faith. Is that great or what? <clears throat> he said work on your speech. He says Always tell the truth. Tell the truth. Stop lying. Stop lying. He said, add to your faith moral excellence. Moral excellence. Listen, there's issues in our culture today. People are so doggone confused. It's just scary to me. He's saying, listen, if you are biologically a man, he said, be a manly man. Don't be a sissy. Don't be passive. Be a man like Jesus. If you're biologically a female, then be a godly woman of virtue. Have moral excellence. In our culture, this is all diminished and it's all blurred, it's all messed up. But it should not be because God has given you and me everything we need for life and goodness, moral excellence, moral excellence. He said, then add to your goodness, knowledge. I find no place in the scriptures where it says, if it feels good, do it. Everywhere in the scriptures, it's therefore, wherefore, hence, whence, and it's always logical. 
We need to have our minds control our feelings, not our feelings control our minds. And here the concept of knowledge is, I like what one commentator said, practical knowledge. You know what it is? Common sense. Something this world lacks today. I mean, I can just give you illustration after illustration. I'm not going to do that, but come on. There's no common sense tell you defunding the police is not a good thing. <laughs> come on. Didn't common sense tell you that? Common sense tells you skipping reading my Bible is not a good thing. Common sense tells me spiritually that neglecting prayer is not a good thing for my faith. You see, practical knowledge says, I know what to do. I know God, God has equipped me. He's given me everything in life. And for godliness. He says, next one, he says, add to your knowledge, self-control. <laughs> I like this one. I often say it'd be great if God gave me a dial like that. I could just dial the self-control. Like, Lord, I sure need a bigger dose right now. And I'd spin that dial. Lord, here, here, here's an incoming, you know, uh, temptation. Help me, Lord. Shh. I'm going to dial that thing up. Oh, I can resist this one. I jokingly often say I can resist anything but temptation. And that's the way I feel sometimes because I'm so much torpedo. Listen, he says, you need to add to your faith, not just what you believe, but you've got you to gotta have self-control. And the idea here is I have self-mastery. I can master myself. I find people all the time say, oh, I try the diet, but I just can't do it. No, yes, you can. Yes, you can. People say to me, well, I don't know that I could fast, you know, for, for a week. Oh, yes, you can. You can. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. For me to say, I can't to say, God, you're a liar. You did not equip me with that. And he said, no. If, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can do it. You, you, you can diet. You, you can quit a drug addiction. You, you just go down the list. You can quit pornography. You, you can quit whatever it is. You can quit that adulterous relationship. You can quit it. You can stop. Because God has given us everything we need to take and control of my own life and my body. You can do that. Isn't this a powerful passage? God has equipped us to do that. The next one is, and you add to that self-control, self-mastery, perseverance. Now, these are all these additives that you're putting in that battery called faith. I believe in God, so I'm going to trust him that, <clears throat> that I can persevere. Now, the word persevere, and I got this bird out there. He's in a storm, and he's just taking a beating. <laughs> he's just taking a beating. It means to endure, to endure, to endure. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about the Hebrew Christians and saying they were abandoning Christ and going back to Judaism because the persecution was so great. <clears throat> and he says, you haven't even resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood. <laughs> Whoa. The expectation is, I, and, and resisting evil, I would even shed my blood. I would, I would die to stop it. That's endurance. I will endure. I will endure. I will endure. I will hang in there. I, I, I will continue. I will persevere. I, I, I'm, I got this self-mastery. I'm going to control myself, and I, I'm going to hang in there. He says, add that to your faith. Put that into your faith as well. Then he goes on and he says, and to your perseverance, add godliness. I didn't know how to display godliness because angels have uh, halos, I guess. I don't know. <clears throat> and as an artist, I draw Jesus with a, a halo so everybody knows which figure is Jesus. Otherwise, they, all my figures look the same. You know what I'm saying? Oh, then, then, then. But a halo, I mean, it's just a glow, and eventually we'll all glow. I know that from the Bible. Uh, we're going to glow in our resurrected bodies. But he says here, <clears throat> add to your perseverance, you're hanging in there, godliness. And the word godliness simply means God-likeness. Christ-likeness. You ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And then you say the more important question, and you say to yourself, no, no, it's not what would Jesus do. 
what will I do that Jesus did? I start to act like Christ. How would Christ respond to this? When I start add, adding to the, my, my faith that I, I, I don't just believe in, in God and I just don't believe in Christ, but I, I'm going to live like Christ, uh, people then will notice that in your life. When I was attending the First Baptist Church of Pontiac and I was on staff there, there was a, a man by the name of Mr. Wilson. And a Mr. Wilson is the godliest guy I think I've ever in my life. Whoa. If you were to pick up his Bible, every page was marked all the way through the whole Bible. He knew, he knew it was Bible. And my name is Dennis, and so as Dennis the Menace, I'd always say, hey, good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> but if somebody were to ask me to describe Mr. Wilson, I would say, he's the closest one I know to Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. Humble, meek, sharing his faith. Always, always giving his undivided attention, no matter what was going on. In fact, when I was a single guy and I was wanting to, I knew I didn't have the gift of singleness and I, I was wanting to find the right person, Mr. Wilson was at the meeting where I said to the elders, I said, listen, I've looked around, she's not here. Would you guys pray that God would bring the right person in my life? Well, Mr. Wilson said, let's do it right now. And the elders stopped the whole meeting and they prayed right then and I met Diane the next week. Now the moral of that story is if you're looking for someone, go to the elders and ask them to pray. No. <laughs> He's a godly man. When people talk about your faith, is the first thing that runs into their mind, oh, they're a lot like Jesus. When I ask that question of myself, I realize how, how far I fall short. I need to add a good dose of God-likeness to my life. Wow. He has, says, add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is the word Philadelphia. I lived in Philadelphia, and it was not a city of brotherly love as it's supposed to be. It was more a brotherly shove. <laughs> Get out of my way. But the concept here is that it's a family love. He says, add to that that you love the brother. Who, who's the family? Christians. Love Christians. Because he's writing to Christians. <clears throat> and then he says on top of that, add, add to your brotherly kindness, genuine, self-sacrificing, agape love. Love like God loves. Wow, these are a ton of ingredients. Listen to this. He says, for if, and these are, these are real qualities, he says, if you possess these qualities, which qualities? These qualities, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, love. He says, if you possess these qualities, you put them with your faith. He says, if you do that, here's what's coming up, a great promise. This is the promise. If you will do this, here's the promise, then they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. In other words, they will make you effective and productive. You want your life to mean something productive and, and have purpose? Then you add these ingredients to your faith, and, and then you're going to see that, wow, things, I got purpose. I got, I got a mission to accomplish, and God is doing things. My life is effective. I'm touching other people's life in powerful, positive ways. You get recharged. He says, and this recharge is in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, it's not knowledge about Jesus. It's knowledge of Jesus. When you add this to your faith, you get to know Jesus himself all the more. All the more. He says, but if anyone does not have these, and you take those away, you take all those away, he says, that person is nearsighted and blind. Oh my goodness, you're walking about in the dark. You're bumping into things through life, you're ineffective, you're nearsighted, you, you don't know what you're doing, you're bumping in and, and you're just rambling through life. You're like a tumbleweed, just blowing in the wind. But if you add these things to your life, you're effective, you're productive, your life has meaning. He says, 
<clears throat> the person who neglects these things, not only are they blind, but he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins by the power of the Almighty God. You forgot what it was like when you first got saved and you had the joy of the Lord in your heart. You want to get that recharge? You want to have that faith, that fire back? You add to your faith these ingredients and it will jumpstart your spiritual life. He says, therefore, my brother, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. <clears throat> that word calling was already given to us in verse 3. He says, make sure you're one of those that God has picked, God has called, God has chosen. And how do you do that? He goes on and he says, for if you do these things, you will never fall. You'll never be unsure. You'll never stumble. If you're adding to your faith, you will have a confidence and a surety in your heart that you know Jesus and that Jesus knows you. Isn't that powerful? You can have certainty that you are on your way to heaven because he has worked faith in your heart and you've been adding these to it and it's been recharging you and you are fired up for the Lord. Wow. He says, and if you will receive, he says, and you will also receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine on that day you stand before him and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Let's suppose for a moment that you did die right now. And you went to heaven. And God met you at the gate and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? Exactly what would you say? Whew. I ask that question to a lot of people. And I get a lot of responses. Number one. I'm a good person. Eh. <laughs> That's my buzzer. Doesn't work. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <clears throat> but I, I've done a lot of good things. My good outweighs my bad. Eh. Wrong answer. There's none that goeth good, no, not one. Romans 3, 10 through 12. Whew. I've been baptized. Eh. <laughs> that doesn't work either. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. That doesn't work. And it goes on. I'm a member of the church. I, I tithe. All these things are good works. It's for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And, 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 and. There's only one right, correct answer. The only correct answer is I accepted Jesus as my Savior and I made him my Lord. I placed my faith in what he has done. I have called upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord has saved me. I've added to my faith these other things because he's changed my desires. I have this new nature. I, it's not that I have to do these things. I want to do these things. I want to do them. Because I'm a new creature in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. You see, the only correct answer is I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And if you haven't done that, you can do that today. You can do that today. You see, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him. Not through a rejuvenator you stick in a battery, but through our knowledge of Jesus. I go to Jesus and I confess I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And that he alone, his death on the cross, is what I'm trusting in the saving, that all who call upon him will be saved. Wow. And you can do that right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, someone here or watching online right now knows in the depth of their heart their battery is drained. They have a dead battery. They need to be infused with the life of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And so that they who are dead in their trespasses and sin will be quickened and made alive, empowered, connected with the divine nature and have eternal life. And still others, they know deep down inside, they have neglected their faith for whatever reason. Their spiritual batteries are drained. And right now they know they need to add those ingredients and say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to you. 
So when they pray right now, Lord, whether one prays, say, Lord, save me, or one says, Lord, I'm coming back. Show yourself in your divine power that they can overcome everything because you've given them everything they need for life and godliness. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.